Ruin, Mated to the Alien, written by Kate Rudolph and Star Huntress, narrated by Zachary Michael. Chapter 13 Lys was falling for Rue, hard, and had started some time back in Polai, maybe when they'd made out just before they were caught, or even some time before then. She couldn't pinpoint the exact moment, but the emotions had caught up to her now and were a storm churning in her brain. Though falling might not have been the right term, she was terrified and excited that she'd already fallen and was just waiting for one little hint from him to admit it. Because that was the weird thing. They'd escaped Polai more than a week before, and in that time, they'd spent a good portion of their time together. They would talk and laugh, casually brush up next to each other, share their meals, and generally do everything that two people who really liked each other did. But Rue hadn't kissed her, not really kissed her since they'd been interrupted. And things were getting uncomfortable. Okay, she was horny. Her feelings weren't only hormones, but there was a definite chunk of her that wanted to climb on top of him and ride him into ecstasy. God damn it, that would be fun. The cockpit seemed a little cramped to get the job done, but they each had their quarters and there was the hollow room, so it was not a lack of space that kept them apart. It was Rue. She caught him looking at her when he didn't think she noticed, and he had that smoldering look in his eyes that told her she belonged in his bed. It lit her up, and her dreams had gone from steamy to creatively wicked. Four nights in a row, she'd woken up panting and on the verge of screaming out his name, she tried to hint that she was open to him, that she wanted his caress. First, she made sure to stand too close, invade his space. She bent over at times, showing off her ass. She touched him, brushing her fingers against his thigh and coming within inches of his cock. Every single action she took would have been obvious to a red-blooded earth male that she was hot for him. He still wanted her. She was certain of it. It was evident in those stolen glances, in the words he almost said to her. Each time he slipped and called her Denya, she saw him wince as if he wished that he could stop himself. At first, the term had scared her. Now, she wrapped it around herself like a warm blanket. She didn't understand fate or magical bonds, but it made Rue hers, and that was all that mattered. Even if the attraction evaporated once they made it to civilization, he was hers now and she was done pretending otherwise. Eight days after jumping through the gate and escaping Poland territory, Lys sat in the cockpit with Rue. Wiring seemed to grow out of every panel of the walls, and every day there was more and more tangled all around Rue's workstation. And every hour the alarm sounded for one of them to check the nav system. In eight days, it hadn't once led them off course, but Rue wasn't content to trust it. Half of the wires he fiddled and interacted with, the nav controls in some way, and if he cut the wrong one, they could easily lose their way. But it was too much work for just one man. He hadn't been completely caught up in his wiring. He'd taken time to teach her how to check the system against the maps he kept stored in a separate database, and after she absorbed that, he'd shown her how to manually fly the ship. She wouldn't be able to practice breaking Atmo or landing until they found a suitable planet, but she could take over if something happened to Rue and the autopilot. After she'd learned how to monitor the nav system, she and Rue had fallen into a pattern of sleeping in shifts. One of them was always up to monitor the controls, and when they were both awake, they spent most of their time together, either sitting in the cockpit or the kitchen. She'd been cooped up with other people before and been on the brink of violence within a day or two. With Rue, it felt nice, comfortable, right. At the moment, she wasn't doing much, but her gaze dropped to where Rue sat, propped against the wall, his brows drawn down in harsh contemplation. He scowled and threw down the handful of wires he'd been working with. Damn it, he said. Apparently, he hadn't gotten the memo uncomfortable. What? Liz asked. He'd been working all day, occasionally talking with her, but mostly just staring at his project. <sighs> Nothing. Rue blew out a breath, the hair that had fallen across his eyes momentarily flying away before settling back down. I'm merely frustrated. I misspliced the cords, he explained, holding up a bright yellow piece of wire. Lys put down the small piece of equipment she'd been studying and stood up. Okay, that's it. 
Rue had to tilt his head back to look at her sudden height. Excuse me? We've both got cabin fever or something. It's time for a break. They'd spent too long working. Every single waking moment was connected to keeping the ship flying. And right now, she suspected Rue was working on the wires just to keep himself busy, not because they would fall out of space without it. Cabin fever? He asked. Liss waved her hands around and said, Small space, nowhere to go, only the two of us. We're stressed. He kept his tone deliberately even, but she knew he was still on edge. The trip will only take a few more days. I can keep track of the nav system if you need some time. Ruin. She cut him off. His face jerked and his eyes glowed red. How she'd ever read that look as demonic, she didn't know. That was pure desire. We both need to relax, she said, trying not to get distracted. So we need to take a break. He pointed to the central computer. The nav system. Liss wasn't interested in that just now. She had other ideas. Just three hours. We can check it after. If it goes off course. It hasn't yet, and it won't do much harm if it does. They could spare a little time to unwind, and at worst, they'd end up a little off course. That could easily be corrected. They were in empty space. There wasn't much danger of flying into a star or hitting a planet. Rue grinned. What do you propose? A walk in the park. She held out her hand, and he rose from his nest of equipment and took it. After they set the alarm for three hours, Liss led Rue down the hallway to the hollow room. When she wasn't sleeping or sitting in the cockpit with Rue, she'd spent a little time experimenting with the different settings of the hollow player. She set it to the one that she wanted and watched the forest of maple trees sprout up around them. It's not quite home, but it's close. It looked a little like the movies she'd seen of parks from the end of the 20th century. The sky above them was a clear blue interspersed with fluffy white clouds. Trees shot up fifty or more feet in the air with green leaves providing a bit of shade. There was nothing like that in the wastes, but it still felt almost like earth. She took Rue's hand and walked with him down a leaf-strewn path. The air was fresh and whispered around them, tousling her hair, not cold enough that she needed a coat. Birds chirped off in the distance, and it smelled fresh, green, and lively, everything that she imagined a forest should smell like. But it wasn't just the forest she wanted to see. The little path terminated outside of a small cottage. The woods blocked them from walking any further, but the wooden building looked completely inviting. If some fairy tale witch had claimed it, she must have been one of the good ones. Liz smiled at Rue. I saw it last time I chose this hollow, but I didn't go inside. Why not? he asked. Because I didn't want to go alone. There was something special about this place, something that she wanted to share with him. That might have seemed silly. This was his hollow program, after all. He could have gone into the cabin any number of times, but from the contemplative look in his eyes, it was new to him as well. They walked up the gray stone pathway to the door and climbed the three steps onto the porch. It was a log cabin made of reddish wood with dark tiles covering the roof. Liss saw smoke billowing out of the chimney. She opened the door and stepped in, Rue right behind her, his body heat seeping into her skin through her clothes. She leaned back, pressing herself lightly against him. Rue placed a hand on her hip and was about to slide it away when Liss covered it with her own fingers. He stilled. Physics had been thrown out the window. From the outside, the cabin had appeared small, one story and perhaps a few hundred square feet. They'd been in the middle of a forest and it should have been surrounded completely with trees. But the inside of this cabin was enormous. The roof soared above them, probably twenty feet high or more. It was too tall to make out the detailing of the decorated wooden beams on the ceiling. Along one wall there was a fireplace that would have fit into a palace. It was taller than her, and the fire that roared within was hot and big enough to roast a boar. A big furry rug was laid out before the fire in between two high-backed leather chairs. However, the cottage had only one star. A four-poster bed took up an entire quarter of the room. A dozen people could sleep comfortably without any risk of rolling over onto each other. Opposite the front door, a large window took up most of the wall. 
It looked out over a cliff and onto the ocean, where waves crashed against rocky outcroppings. Is this what all of your dwellings look like? Rue asked, voice full of wonder. Lys couldn't stop the laughter that bubbled up on her throat. <laughs> God, no. I can touch the opposite walls of my room if I really reach for it, and there aren't any windows. Even the crew quarters she was sleeping in now were nicer, though she knew if she were sharing that room with three other people, she wouldn't have the same opinion. This place is special, and not just because it would be a palace on Earth. He stepped in past her and looked around, slowly turning so he could drink in all of the details. But his eyes finally settled on her, bright red with his inner fire. Yes, special. Liss's heart skipped a beat. He wasn't talking about the cabin. The kiss had been days in coming, and when they closed the distance between themselves and his lips covered hers, it was like taking her first gulp of water after months in the desert. This was what coming home felt like. She didn't care that he was an alien, that his tongue was slightly pointed with strange ridges on it, or that his body was covered with the most fascinating patterns that she'd ever seen on a person. A distant part of her thought that he should have tasted strange. None of Rue's building blocks had come from Earth. He'd never eaten an apple or petted a cat. But as her tongue rasped against his, nothing could have felt more familiar, more like home. It wasn't that he was something that she knew. It was that he was everything she needed. Her fingers grasped his shoulders, digging in deep. Rue hitched one hand under her thigh until she wrapped her legs around his waist, letting him take all of her weight and support her completely. She was wrapped around him, clutching him close as his lips devoured hers. This wasn't like kissing a human man. His tongue had those delicious little ridges, and his teeth were too pointy. He pressed her up against the wall, letting it do most of the work to keep her in place. But wild horses couldn't have dragged Lys away from him, not right now, not when she was on fire with desire, and more than a little in love with the way his tongue played against hers. When he tried to pull back, Lys dipped in again, keeping him flush up against her. She felt the growing hardness of his cock against her stomach. Her insides clenched, and she knew that she was wet at her core. It would take little work to slip out of her clothing and take him inside of her. God above, she yearned for him. She arched her hips up, rubbing against him, her most sensitive flesh against his own. Rue groaned and lightly bit on her lip, tugging at it. Liz set one foot down on the ground, trying to find some semblance of balance, but that only brought her into closer contact. Why wasn't she naked right now? Rue kissed down her jaw and over the rapid pulse in her neck. His fingers splayed against the swell of her breast, and she bit her lip to keep from moaning as he stroked over the sensitive flesh. Do you like that? He asked, his voice husky and full of lust. Liz let the moan free, barely able to say, Yes. You're more than sensitive right here, aren't you? It was only when he asked that, she realized he'd never made love to a human before. Liz reached up and placed her hand over his own. It's sensitive here, she confirmed, and then she took his hand lower until his fingers barely brushed the juncture of her thighs. And very sensitive here. The red of Rue's eyes darkened to almost black as he gently stroked one finger against her. For a moment, Liz remembered the claws he could summon up at any moment but she felt no fear. She knew to the very foundation of her being that Rue would not hurt her. She thought he would fall to his knees right there to bring her pleasure, but instead, he tugged gently on her hand and led her across the room where he laid her down on the bed. Let me give you a taste of what we could be, he said. Liz didn't know what we meant in that sentence, but all she cared about was the taste. Do whatever you want, she responded, unclasping the button above the zipper on her jumpsuit. He revealed her, inch by glorious inch, and it was short work of sliding out of the top and shedding her undershirt before her breasts were bare before him. His hands smoothed over the skin of her stomach, and Lys wasn't self-conscious of the swell of her stomach or the curve of her hips. Rue looked ravenous. 
He leaned down and pressed his lips to the skin above her navel, letting that tongue of his lap at the soft flesh. Lys shivered under him, her legs unconsciously spreading wider to accommodate where he knelt between them. He kissed and licked up a straight line from her navel to her chest, only stopping when he met the soft mounds in his way. Are they always this big? He rolled his eyes up at her to ask. Lys grinned, the possessive desire in his eyes making her squirm against the soft white sheets. Human women come in all sizes, but I'm a bit curvier than most. I love your curves. He spoke with a naked honesty and then proved his point by taking the tip of her breast into his mouth, carefully lapping at the soft, sensitive flesh. The sharp points of his teeth barely scraped against her skin, sending a warning skitter of ice across her shoulders. It melted into a puddle of hot wax as Rue's fingers reached deeper, diving into the seam of her jumpsuit and laying against the tender folds of her sex. Yes, she wanted to cry out, but her words were suddenly caught in the supernova bursting somewhere in her chest. Her heart unfurled as her legs spread, her sex aching for the pleasure that only Rue's fingers or his cock could give to her. She was an eager slave to it, wanting in a way that she didn't know she could want. And then his fingers were brushing against the wet heat of her sex, and Lys's mind gave up trying to think about anything but the sensations he was giving her. Rue was a quick study, listening for every one of her indrawn breaths and little pants. When his fingers found her clitoris, he circled it, repeating the motion over and over as she arched her hips up against him, trying to take more contact. And he gave, and he gave, whispering words to her in a language she couldn't understand. She didn't need to understand it. They were speaking a language beyond words now. His eyes practically glowed as he focused on her like some kind of ferocious predator. Maybe that intensity should have scared her, but it only ratcheted up her desire for him. Sweat poured off of her, and she couldn't suck in a breath while he played her like a finely tuned instrument. Rue dipped a finger inside of her, and then another, his thumb still rubbing around at the knot of pleasure at her core. Please, Lys whimpered, unsure of exactly what she wanted. Rue jerked up, his eyes twin flames. Let go, Denya, he commanded, and added a third finger, stretching her, making her ready for him. Lys shattered, convulsing around him. Her thoughts all scattered away as the pleasure took her under, powered entirely by Rue's hands and the gruff order in his voice. She bucked against him, her body jerking as his unrelenting hands brought her to a second orgasm right on the heels of the first. It was too much, and Lys cried out, the sound ending in a moan that Rue captured with his lips against hers. Only as she quivered against him and made little sounds of overloaded pleasure did he begin to show mercy, removing his fingers and petting her lightly, bringing her down for the razor's edge of pleasure. With his lips against hers, Lys shouldn't have been able to catch her breath, but little by little she came down from the high. But she couldn't stop herself from kissing him, tasting his tongue against hers and feeling his cheek cradled in her palm. This wasn't just sex, not when she felt so safe in his arms, not when she could almost let herself believe the promise in Rue's touch. You're thinking, Rue chided when he pulled back. In the dim light of the room, she might have almost confused him for human if it weren't for those eyes. His cheekbones were cut from pure granite, but the tilt of his mouth to one side let her know that he was only teasing. Only about you she promised. She lifted Rue's shirt up until he read her intent and took it off himself. Then she pressed her hand flat against his naked chest, her fingers tracing over the bottom line of his markings. Roll over. Though she knew that he would not always accede to her commands, he followed this one until he was the one vulnerable on his back. The swell of his erection pressed tightly against his pants. I need to feel you she said, only realizing the depth of the confession once the words were out. But Rue didn't push for more. He gave himself completely over to her. I am yours. She sat up beside him, conscious that her breasts hung free in her jumpsuit. 
Rather than zip back up, she pushed down the sleeves until she was half naked before him. Lys shivered at the heat in his eyes. She was still hungry for him, still desperate to have him buried inside of her, but something held her back from getting completely naked and taking that step. That was a line that couldn't be uncrossed, and she knew it would change everything. But she could give him pleasure just as he'd given it to her. After all, that was only fair, and she wanted him naked and panting beneath her fingers. She took care when she undid the catch of his pants. Rue's cock sprang free from its confines, and Lys had to bite back a moan at the sight of it while she pulled his pants down to his knees. His cock stood proud out of a tuft of dark hair. It was the same greenish color as the rest of his skin, but the markings that covered his chest and shoulders reappeared to cover it from base to tip. She ran her finger down the length of him and discovered that each of those markers were actual soft ridges. Her pussy clenched as she imagined him inside of her. Rue hissed and bucked his hips as she repeated the movement. She rolled her eyes up to the head of the bed to see his hands clenched against the rails of the headboard, keeping himself tightly in place while she played. Do you like that? she asked. The yes that ripped from his lips was more guttural curse than encouragement, but his added, don't stop, kept Liss enthralled. She loved the power she could have in the bedroom, loved that he let himself be so exposed to her. She curled her fingers around him, her fist not completely able to close around his length. He was hot ice and soft steel, thick and heavy in her palm. And when she moved her fist up and down, she knew it was taking all of his control not to jerk up and take her there. His every move fascinated her, and when she saw him bite his lip to keep a moan from escaping those amazing lips of his, Lys moved her hand faster, bringing him closer and closer to the blinding point of pleasure. His head tilted back, and he sucked in a breath, and she saw that he was trying to keep himself from coming, trying to hold out. But this was about giving him pleasure, not about endurance. Not when she was already sated for the moment, and Lys wanted him desperate and sated under her fingers. With a cry, he came, exploding in her hand, his claws slashing out and ripping into the sheets. He bucked up with a moan and sunk into the bed, his muscles loosening as the pleasure took him over. Lys watched him, knowing that he had just become her favorite object of study. She wiped her hand against the sheets and curled up next to him. Rue turned over and pulled her into his arms. She could feel his heartbeat, though it wasn't in exactly the same place as her own. But the rhythm felt right and it settled Liss down even as her own thoughts began to twist and turn. She wasn't falling for Rue anymore. No, she had fallen in love with him. Now she just had to figure out what the hell that meant for her future, because she had no clue how she could let him go. Chapter 14 After a twelve days' journey, Liss and Rue arrived at Onora Station. Rue was bursting at the seams with energy as they docked in one of the mechanic bays. The ship would go into the queue before they could have someone look at it for any issues that the Poland blast had done to the hull, but he assured her that it wouldn't take more than a week to fix. As they climbed off the ship and into the mechanic station, Lys's eyes couldn't focus on any one thing. She was on a real space station. She'd only seen vids and photos of the ones near Earth. This one didn't look anything like that. Seoul Station, the busiest and most technologically advanced station near Earth, was all smooth lines and bright colors. One of her favorite vid programs took place in the station, and it seemed to be half pleasure palace and half high-tech wonder zone. The mech bay on Anora had clearly been cobbled together over the years, built, rebuilt, expanded, and contracted as the traffic through this sector fluctuated. Metal in half a dozen different shades decorated the walls where tools and supplies hung suspended by dark cables. Even the air smelled faintly metallic. The ceiling reached up hundreds of feet in the air where it could be opened to an airlock where ships could fly inside like she and Rue just had. She'd never seen anything like it, not in person. Her eyes finally settled on Rue, who was watching her watch the station. 
I need to see about getting a new part from an old friend. He held up a mass of melted metal and wires he'd pulled from the engine room. It seemed to be the reason the nav system wasn't cooperating. Would you like to join me? He asked. If you don't mind, I'm going to take a look around. This is my first time on a space station. She needed to walk around. They were still in artificial gravity, but not even the hollow player could mimic the pathways she could walk on this station. There were miles and miles of hallways and shops. For the first time in more than a week, she'd be able to properly stretch herself out. A small part of her, so minuscule that the thought barely flickered, whispered that she could walk away right now and not look back. There was nothing to stop her. Nothing except her heart. A shadowed look fell over Rue's eyes, and he smiled, but there was melancholy in it. I'll see you later? he asked, hopeful. Liss nodded. Sure, that would be nice. She gave him a quick hug and kiss before heading down the main hallway to explore. She made it several feet before she realized that they hadn't planned where or when to meet. Liss turned around to call back to Rue, but he wasn't there. For a moment, she felt lost, suddenly untethered from the man who had become the source of her gravity. She wanted to turn right back around and hunt him down, but Liss made herself stand in place. This was the first time that she was truly alone since she'd met Rue. She needed to take a little time, even if it was just a few hours, to gather her thoughts. The hallway terminated at a pair of double doors that slid open when she waved her hand over the sensor panel on the wall. Liss turned right, going toward where she could hear a mass of people and see more lights. She was in no danger on Anora Station. Rue had told her that she could even leave her blaster, his blaster technically, behind on the ship. But she kept it strapped to her side. It might have been safe, but she wanted to be sure. The second hallway led her to a bright room filled with people and shops. It looked like a space-age bazaar. A few permanent shops were located in offices along the walls of the huge room, but for the most part, people were set up in tents and corrals around the entire floor. Walkways existed, but they were in waving lines more like a river than a city street. And everything was alien. Liss walked around, her eyes darting from species to species, noting the differences and trying not to stare at the people and creatures who looked so different from herself. She'd become accustomed to Rue's strangeness, but now, seeing beings with four arms or tentacles slithering out of their chests, she was struck by just how similar he truly was to her. Liss chose a path and walked it, taking her time in every stall which caught her eye. A pink woman with bright eyes offered her a sample of a scrumptious, sparkling cake. Liss took it and swallowed it whole, laughing as it popped and fizzled in her mouth. A whole new world opened up to her in the marketplace, one she'd imagined when she was sitting in that orphanage as a little girl, but never imagined that she'd ever see. She spotted dozens of different aliens, some of whom seemed to be trying to take on a crew. She could walk up to any one of them and see if they'd take her away from here, away from her old life, and away from Rue. It felt so fundamentally wrong to even think it that she forced herself through the process. She couldn't let camaraderie and a few decent, well, mind-blowing orgasms dictate what she did for the rest of her life. Liss studied several of the tents. In one, an alien who looked a little like a bipedal rhinoceros talked to two aliens who each had four legs and almost looked like centaurs, except their legs were covered in scales, not fur. There was also a gathering of aliens like the pink one who'd given her cake. They talked to a person who was nearly seven feet tall and completely covered by a dark cloak. Out of the corner of her eye, she thought she saw the distinctive dark green skin that she'd seen on Palai, but by the time she turned her head, whatever she thought she'd seen was gone. There were no Polans here. They didn't leave their planet. They weren't going to follow her and Rue across light years. Why would they? She forced herself back to the decision. The Poland was only her mind playing tricks on her, trying to distract her from thoughts of leaving Rue. She could really do it. He probably half expected her to. She'd caught the sad look in his eyes. A part of him didn't think that he'd ever see her again. All she had to do was walk up to one of the people recruiting crew and sign up. 
She didn't need Rue to take her home. She didn't even need to go back to Earth if that was what she chose. In this moment, she was completely free. She just needed to make the choice. Human girl! The sound of someone shouting at her shook Liss out of her daze. She looked around until her eyes caught on two human women she hadn't noticed before. One was over six feet tall and looked like she could lift up a house. Her lithe partner sat in a chair, feet propped up on a little table. Since her translator buzzed against her skin, she knew they weren't speaking English. From the looks of it, they might have been Korean. Liss realized that she'd been standing in the middle of the walkway for some time. She hustled over to the two human women. It's nice to see someone from home. The muscular woman eyed her and said, Oh, Nora, station is a bit out of the way for a grounder like you. Grounder? Liss hadn't ever heard the term. This is your first time in space, the other woman explained, not bothering to get up. Is it that obvious? Liss wanted to laugh. She must have been staring at everything like a tiny child. Both women smiled, and the one standing in front of her said, Yeah. But she offered, Please, join us for tea. Who's us? She asked. I'm Sung Mi, said the tall woman. She pointed to the one in the chair. That is Bitna. Sung Mi pointed to two empty chairs and waited for Liz to take her seat before producing a small teapot from a storage panel in their table. I'm Liz. Liz Jenks. You're American? asked Bitna. After a swat on her feet from Sung Mi, she finally sat up with her feet on the ground. Yes, out of the wa, out of Ohio. No one knew about the wastes if they weren't from the Midwest. She doubted most people outside of the states even knew where Ohio was. We operate out of Seoul Station, Sung Mi said as she set out three cups and poured the tea. Wow, I've seen it in vids. That's so cool. She must have seemed like some country bumpkin if these two worked out of Seoul. How did you end up here? Bitna asked. Humans don't vacation on Anora. She didn't mean to tell them everything. Really, Liz had completely meant to offer a few pleasantries and a highly edited version of what had happened. But once she started talking, it all just tumbled out. She explained being taken from Earth by forces unknown, being dumped on Palai. She kept some things about Rue to herself, but that was because it was private, and she wasn't quite sure what it meant. And he's Detyan, or whatever, and I'm human, she said, winding down her rant. So, I don't even... She couldn't finish the thought. Bitna narrowed her eyes. Detyan? she asked. They are those weirdos who die or whatever because they don't fuck. What? Liz must have heard her wrong, because Rue had never told her anything like that. Sung Mi shook her head. No, that's Cantons. I don't think so. Bitna held firm. What are you talking about? Liz looked away, trying to clear her head. In the distance, she thought she saw a Polin, but when she tried to pick him out of the crowd, he wasn't there. Bitna held up a hand, drawing Liz's attention back to her. No, I remember. One signed on for that run to wherever. She shared a glance with Sung Mi and said nothing about where they'd worked. He was all sad because he hadn't found his... He had some weird word for it. Uh, Denda or something. Denya? Liz asked, a pit opening in her stomach. Bitna pursed her lips and nodded. Sounds right. Liss remembered the sad state of his emergency supplies and his carefree attitude at the thought of refilling them. They'd spent hours talking about their pasts, but any words he spoke of the future had been vague. Liss hadn't realized it at the time, but he'd spoken like a man with few tomorrows. Why do they die? she asked. The women shrugged. Why do humans age? Sung Mi asked. It's all weird evolution stuff. Liz needed to talk to Rue. She needed to find him right this instant and demand that he tell her everything. Was he about to die because she hadn't mated with him? Was he trying to make some stupid sacrifice because she hadn't said she loved him? But Sung Mi didn't catch the change in Liz's tone. Can you work? She asked. Yes, why? Liz needed to go, 
but she wasn't just going to rudely leave the only humans she'd met in weeks. Because one of our crew decided to jump ship for another freight run, said Sung Mi. We're swinging near enough to Earth that we could drop you home, if you're willing to work for the cost of the trip. List didn't answer. She couldn't. Not until she found Rue. Chapter 15 Loam had owned the workshop on Anora Station for the better part of fifty years. In brighter days, he and his Denya had been a well-oiled team, fixing up ships and selling used parts to any traveler that needed them. Rue had spent a good chunk of his childhood in this shop when his aunt or uncle passed through Anora, and now he was here by himself with a busted converter, praying that the man didn't shut the door in his face. He'd put the trip off as long as possible after splitting from Lys, but delivering the package from Palai to his broker, Monk, had only taken an hour. Even so, Rue had lingered for several more minutes as Monk offered him a contract to extract an embedded agent of the Oscavian Empire from a hostile planet. But it was a two-person job, and it would take months to pull off. Two weeks ago, he would have said no out of hand, or rather, he wouldn't have listened to the proposal at all. Now, shaky though they were, he had options. He had hope. The part of him that had long ago given up hope of living past thirty wanted to jump on the nearest transport ship to Hedonia and carry out his plans as intended. But the thought of taking pleasure from anyone but Lys repulsed him. She was his Denya, and he belonged to her completely, even if this was the end. Rue walked into the shop and saw that he'd started Loam who stood behind a waist-high counter working on the wiring of a circuit board. Loam was tall and broad, his skin a rich teal and his markings bright against it, and while he had to be edging on ninety, he didn't look a day over thirty. That was how it was for mated Detyans, even ones like Loam. Once he recovered from the momentary shock, Loam set aside his tools and straightened. Now, there's a face I never expected to see again, he said. He walked out from behind the counter and clasped a hand around Rue's shoulders. Rue hugged him back. Loam was like another uncle to him. It was good to see family, and he didn't exaggerate. The last time Rue left, he expected it to be goodbye for good. I ran into a bit of trouble, Rue told him, though it might have been an understatement. Loam thumped his hand against Rue's back and let him go, a broad smile hanging on his face. Starting wars again? No one ever seemed to let that drop. By the gods, he'd been doing his job. That was one time, he insisted, and it was more of a family squabble. No planets had been destroyed, and it all ended up all right in the end. Loam shook his head and settled back against the counter. So, what brings you here? he asked. Converter blew out during my last job. Rue held up the mangled mess of wires he'd pulled from the center console in the cockpit. I need a replacement. Loam's eyebrows shut up. I've never heard of a converter blowing out. That was the problem with family. They were always asking questions and making uncomfortable observations. Then, perhaps, Rue conceded, was blown out would be more appropriate. You're a damn fool, boy. The laughter evaporated from Loam's face, and now he stood before Rue as a Detian elder chastising an unmated male nearing his end. You think you can waste your final months simply because time is short? Rue heard the fear there and the heartbreak. It wasn't only because they were nearly family. With every life cut short by this idiotic quirk in biology, they lost one more hope at regaining their place as a people. The Detians were dying out. Loam, no. Loam waved his arms in front of him like he could put up a wall to keep from looking at Rue. We said our goodbyes. Your aunt came crying here not two weeks ago. And your cousin. Oh, huh. I... He didn't want to think of Aunt Gwai crying or the scene that Tabra would have caused. It wasn't his fault that he was nearing his birthday and he didn't know how to stop his people from hurting for it. But Loam wasn't finished. When we say goodbye, it's for a reason. Rue had to stop this. I met my Denya, he said. Loam's eyebrows shut up. When? Where? 
How? Where is she? Why are you still here? The questions tumbled out, at first excitement, with the last one edging into sadness. Lom's own Denya had taken off long ago. Rue didn't know all of the details, and no one liked to talk about it. She's still on the station, I think. He'd know it if she left. He'd feel it in his soul. And despite whatever nascent doubts lived in his mind, he knew that she would never leave him without saying goodbye. Ruin, if you are not the fool I've known you to be, you will find her right this instant and not let her out of your sight until she has accepted that you are hers. His tone was deadly serious, and Rue was reminded why he never wished to cross Loam. But he was not a boy any longer, and even though he cared for Lys and wanted her with every breath, he could not ignore the facts of their situation. It's not that simple, he objected. She's not... Interested in men? Lom scoffed. I've never heard the bond form like that. Neither had Rue. There was no such thing as a Denya bond forming where desire and love could not. She's human, he stated plainly. Lom's eyes widened, and he leaned forward. Human? Yes, not Detyan. And she's... It's complicated. She was light years away from home brought here by strangers, and rescued or kidnapped by him. He wasn't sure how she would define their journey together. Humans were not like Detyans. They didn't bond in the same ways. He had dedicated his own heart to her from the first kiss, but even now as they found their pleasure in one another, she held herself back. But those were not sentiments he was prepared to share with Lom. And Lom did not seem to care. Do you want her? He asked. Of course with his every breath in the spaces in between. Is the bond true? Yes. She was with him always, a shadow of her essence, a presence in his consciousness. Loam nodded, and Rue thought he was satisfied, but after a beat, Loam asked one final question. Do you care that she's not one of us? No. The denial sprouted before any thought. So, Lys was human. Why should that matter? She was his Denya, the only person in the entire universe truly meant for him. Frankly, it was a miracle that he was the only Detyan to ever meet his mate outside of the species. Lom looked at him, eyebrow raised, and said nothing. And that one eyebrow said it all. Rue was a thrice damned fool if he let Lys leave the space station without fighting for her. He needed her to know that he wanted her, not because of fate, or survival, or anything so vast. He needed her because she was his breath, and he would do anything to keep her. He set his busted part on the counter and said, I'll come back for the converter in a few days. And you'll bring your human with you? Lom asked. Yes, he would. Chapter 16 Lys left her fellow humans behind and went in search of Rue. At first, she planned to go back to the ship, hoping that he would eventually end up there. But as she turned down the hall outside the marketplace, her intuition pinged, telling her to go right instead of left. She had no reason to trust it, but Lys could feel a pull of some kind coming from that direction. She was absolutely certain that Rue was there. She just had to find him. Running on instinct, she took the hallways quickly, barely noticing where she went. In the end, she stumbled into a small cove of shops just in time to see Rue step out of one, the door closing behind him. The rest of the people in this section of the station might as well have ceased to exist. She could feel the universe shift, the axis realigning until it was only her and him, bound together through something greater than themselves. On the ship, it had been him and her against the universe. She'd felt security beside him, but everything that had grown with it had been too tangled. Now, off the ship, and with the prospect of returning to Earth a real possibility, she could begin to differentiate the threads of emotions running through her. What she couldn't do was untie the knot in her heart that tightened every second she stared at Rue. The corner of his mouth lifted up in a smile, and he stood up straighter when he saw her. 
The distance between them dissolved until they were standing face to face in the center of the walkway. Rue placed his hand on Lissa's back and led her a little way down the path until they could stand in a little recessed alcove. I thought you were exploring, he said, a finger casually drawing circles along her spine. Two women from Seoul Station offered to take me back to Earth with them. The words tipped out of her mouth without thought, but she couldn't keep them in, couldn't lie to him. Rue's hands still on her back. I see. Lys leaned into him before he could pull away and said, I don't want to go. His eyes widened, irises flaring a bright ruby. He sucked in a breath and tipped her chin up toward his face with his free hand. Lys. Her name dragged out of his lips like a prayer. Are you dying? She'd meant to ease into it, but standing so close to him, smelling his spicy, masculine scents and feeling the heat of his skin, it was all too real. She couldn't let him die. She didn't know what she would do in a universe without him in it. She could see the answer in his eyes the moment she asked. He froze beside her, his fingers practically digging into her hip, and then very slowly he nodded. How did you find out? Lys placed her hands on his cheeks and dragged his head down to swipe her lips over his. His hands slid back until her fingers were grasped behind his neck. She held on so tight, as if the power of her kiss would be enough to keep him safe, keep him alive. His mouth opened, and she tasted his tongue, the strange ridges that had brought her to the heights of pleasure, now delightfully strange and familiar. God above, she loved him. She pulled back as the emotion overwhelmed her, tears threatening to prick at the corners of her eyes. But emotion wouldn't make her weak, and Lys had more than enough experience in schooling her expression. She stayed clasped close to him, needing the heat of his body more than air. The humans I met mentioned it. Were you ever going to tell me? How long? She couldn't even finish the second question. Rue smoothed one hand over her head, gently patting her hair. I didn't want you like that. Before the sting of rejection could even begin to bite, he continued, I want you to take me because you want me, not out of some damn pity. For a moment, a sense of calm settled over Lys, and then the dam broke and she was laughing, the sounds coming out of her mouth full of mirth and barely human. But Rue was concerned. What? Was it something I said? Lys sucked in air, trying to get her breathing under control. Her fingers curled against his chest. You say it like fucking you would be some sort of hardship, she smiled. I've wanted you inside me since our time in the hollow player. Before that, really. What are you saying, Lys? He asked in a ragged whisper. The words, the acceptance, were so simple. I'm saying... I'm your Denya. Those words put the fire of FTL engines into him. They were moving so fast that Lys couldn't keep track of the twists and turns. When he took her down a secluded hallway, she thought he was stopping for a quickie before they made it to wherever they were supposed to end up. But he led her up two flights of stairs and down another hallway to a nondescript door with a small plaque beside it with IC numbers written on it. <sighs> Where are we? She asked, almost out of breath. He glanced back at her and grinned. My family's sweet. None of them are on the station now, so we have it all to ourselves. And from the fire in his eyes and the heat in her core, she knew they definitely need privacy. Back on Earth, the room might have seemed tiny, but after weeks on the ship and before that, being crammed into a tiny slaver's cell, this place felt positively palatial. A small kitchen was tucked in against a wall with a living area laid out beyond it. On the far wall, faux windows looked out onto a simulated pastoral scene. They were on the interior of the space station, but from the looks of the windows, they were on some sunny, verdant planet. A sliding door hung open, 
and beyond it, Liz spotted a bed more than large enough for two people. Excitement and anticipation hummed through her. Rue closed the distance between them, looming over her and trapping her between the door and the hard wall of his body. Right then, he was a little wild, his eyes full of animal hunger, the almost invisible markings along the edges of his hairline becoming visible as the lust within him grew. Say it again, he said, the words a gruff command. Heat curled deep within Lys. She reached up and traced her fingers over his cheek and out until she framed the point of his ear, watching him suck in the breath and pleasure as her fingers traced over the sensitive tip. I'm your Denya, she said once more, firmer now that they were alone and he was looming, the promise of pleasure in his wild eyes. And you're mine. She pulled his head down, but after a second pulled back. You are my Denya, right? This does go both ways. The question tumbled out between brief kisses. Rue's lips curled against hers. I'm not the sharing kind, he confessed, and I could no sooner betray you than harm you. Yes, I am your Denya. The bond works both ways. She could feel something, almost physical, snap between them with those words. Before Rue, She'd never contemplated the concept of commitment. It just didn't exist. No one stayed loyal forever. But right now, she knew to the deepest depths of her soul that he was hers and she was his, and there was nothing on the planet that could possibly change that. The Denya Bond was more beautiful than he could have ever imagined. Rue had never known that it would be a physical thing, or that it could begin to blossom before they completed their joining, but he could see a soft, golden light haloing Lys even in the dim room. It could only be their bond. He reached out and tucked a strand of hair behind her ear, a surge of tenderness overtaking him. You're beyond beautiful, he said, and she was. The Denya light illuminated her dark hair, making it a burnished gold. Those secretive, soft brown eyes of hers were suddenly open to him. The bond gave him no power to read her thoughts, but he could see her desire clear as day. It was a desire that matched his own. It took more control than he would ever admit to trail his fingers gently down her shoulder into her arm, where he linked their fingers together. He wanted to use his claws to tear off her clothes until she was naked and panting before him. His cock ached, thick and hard with desire, but this was their first joining, the beginning of their lives as one, and he would not dishonor that with some hurried coupling powered by hard-driven lust. He'd save that for later. Liss seemed fond of the curve-hugging bodysuits that were popular in the Brassix Consortium. Humans had made a home for themselves there, and the styles flowed freely. Rue planned to buy stock in the finest clothiers there if it kept her kitted out like this. What are you thinking? Lys asked. A small smile quirked the side of her lips. Rue leaned in and kissed the corner of her mouth, unable to resist. I like your outfit, he said. She laughed. <laughs> really? You're thinking about my clothes right now? Rue grabbed the zipper and pulled it down until the tops of her breasts nearly spilled out. I'd like it even better on my floor. She gasped as he pulled the zipper down further, all the way down to the bottom. And when he pushed at her shoulders and helped her step out of it, she didn't resist. And then she was before him, completely naked and more stunning than he could imagine. You're a little overdressed, dear, she told him, the affectionate name coming easily from her lips. But she raised her fingers to her mouth and traced them over as if she could pull the word back. Rue stepped close and tilted up her face, his fingers on her chin. Never hold your words back from me. Never hold anything back, not between us. He would lay down his very soul for her. There was no need for walls between them, not any longer. She dropped her hand and nodded, not able to move too much because he didn't let go. I... this is all so new to me. I don't know how to do this. Liar, 
he said as he leaned in and captured her lips, the curve of a smile caught between them. I've felt your hands on me. For a moment, she didn't respond, her lips busy with a much more intimate discussion. There was no need for words when the taste of every breath passed between them, but after a moment, she placed a hand against his chest, sliding it down to the center, finding the beat of his heart. It beat only for her. Not sex, she said. I've never done the relationship thing. Not like this. Not with so much. She trailed off, eyes stricken as she couldn't find the word. But the primitive, possessive side of Rue bared its teeth in a lethal grin, satisfied that he would be the only man to ever hold her heart. He leaned his head forward against hers. I will never betray you, he vowed. You are my Denya, the one person I shall cherish above all others until I am no more than dust. Her mouth dropped open in a surprised, silent gasp, and after a pause, she swallowed and said, Good. He heard the promise in that word, all of the things that she didn't know how to say. But Rue didn't push. He didn't need her to say the things that he knew were true, not when she stood naked before him. She reached down and placed her hand on the closure of his pants. You need to be naked, she teased. He wasted no time. In a haze of speed, his clothes came off, and somehow they ended up on the bed. Lys scrunching back as he advanced on her, intent on taking her in the most primal sense. She was laid out before him like a banquet, and Rue planned a feast. He took one of her dusky nipples into his mouth, sucking and laving at her until she moaned and squirmed under him. He couldn't keep his hands off of her, petting her sides and stroking little patterns into her flesh. One of his hands trailed lower to the juncture of her thighs, gliding over the dark curls of hair. She gasped when his fingers found the tight butt of her sex, and he rolled around it, taking his cues from the little sounds and movements that she made. He lifted his head up from her breast to kiss over her collarbone and scrape his teeth gently against the skin of her neck. The urge to bite down, to mark her as his in the ancient ways, rode him, but he held himself back. Not yet, he told himself. Wait for him. She tilted her neck to the side, giving him more room to taste, and Rue took advantage, using his lips and tongue to tease her sensitive flesh at the same time his fingers brought her closer and closer to the edge of pleasure. She was so wet beneath him, his fingers were slick. He loved her responses, loved that she didn't hold back from expressing herself as he loved her. He slipped a finger inside of her, and she moaned out a breathless, Yes, the S sliding across his skin as it dragged out. When he added another finger, her breath hitched, and when he started to move them in and out of her, she moved her hips with him, rolling as he opened her up. Her fingers dug into his hair and desire surged in Rue, his cock already close to bursting. The heat was raging inferno between them. I need you, he said. Need to be in you. Yes, she said. Now, and hooked one leg around his hip, bringing them even closer together. Rue needed no more encouragement. He positioned himself at her entrance and guided the blunt head of his cock inside her, biting back a curse as the delicious friction closed around him. She was so wet, but so tight that he moved slowly, easing himself centimeter by steady centimeter until he was fitted all the way in. They stayed locked that way for a moment, gazes caught up in one another. Lys lifted her hand and rubbed it against his cheek. And then he began to move, and it was like nothing Rue had ever felt before. Lys was right there with him, gasping out his name and clinging to him as her hips jerked with his own, his speed increasing as his pleasure ratcheted up, making him into some kind of rutting beast. He could feel her everywhere, not just on his cock, but pressed against him, her lips finding perches against his chin, and even in his mind. It wasn't a psychic connection but rather one of emotion, the bond solidifying between them with every stroke of him inside of her. Can you feel it? 
he demanded, the words ragged. And even though he didn't explain, he knew that Lys understood, her eyes bright with pleasure and love. It's amazing! And then she was gasping and crying out, her body shuddering over his as her orgasm swept through her. Rude didn't give up pumping into her unrelentingly, taking her again as she began to come down from the first wave of pleasure. She gripped his shoulders tight, and Rue had to focus his concentration more than he had ever done before. When she crested again, he felt himself let go, light behind his eyes exploding as the pleasure made him more animal than man. And in that moment, he pulled her tight and placed his lips against her neck, biting hard enough to mark to claim she was his completely.